Welcome to Sequoia Bible Fellowship on YouTube. Greetings tonight in the name of Jesus, and a welcome to everyone. I like the way that John, from the book of Revelation, introduces Jesus Christ with these words. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness of the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He goes on, he says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So that reminds us tonight we are gathered here under the eyes of an all-seeing and all-knowing God. And I greet you in his name. I also bring you greetings from the Owenton Amish Mennonite Church in Owenton, Kentucky. Now you're wondering, where is that? Interesting, we've spent a few days in California. And when they talk about the scenery in California, they all ask us to use our imagination. You imagine. Now you just try and think that these, this, this actually does turn green sometime. Oh, I, really? <laughs> That'd be kidding. So uh, I'm going to try and use my imagination, okay? If you wonder where, what about, where's this fellow come from? Well, I'll take just a few minutes to introduce myself. It's not that important, but. Especially for those of us with Mennonite connections, we always try to connect the dots. And so, to erase all confusion, and maybe I won't have to repeat myself 30 times, but I'll give a little bit of a brief history. It's not important who I am, but this is a little bit of my background. I was born into an Amish home in Hartville, Ohio. And uh, I come from a family of seven children. I have two brothers and four sisters. I appreciate my claim. Amish background. I make no apology that uh, my parents are still part of the Amish church. And uh, now, some of you think that's speaking in tongues, but uh, I can verify that. That's uh, We talk Pennsylvania Dutch at home. I'm also aware that my Amish background and upbringing does not guarantee salvation. I, like anyone else, needed to come to the foot of the cross and find forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1972, when I was 17 years old, and I know you're doing the math, how old am I? Huh? Okay, 57. Once you're past 40 or 45, it doesn't really matter. But when I was 17 years old, my family moved to extreme northwest Pennsylvania, Amish community, where I met my future wife. 1977, I married Carter May Nisley from the community there. And the Lord has blessed us with five children. Our two oldest sons, Jonathan, who is 34, is married and has two children. He lives in Owenton with us. Leon is 32. I guess Jonathan's 33 now. I need to ask my wife. I can't keep track. They, just like their daddy, they keep getting older. I guess Jonathan's 33. Leon's 32. He has two children. He lives in Litchfield. Our three youngest children, Michael is 29, Sharon is 24, and Cheryl is 23. They still live at home. And people tease my wife and I, they say, you must be taking too good a care of them that you hang on to them this long. I say, well, we're glad to have them with us. 1987, we joined the Amish Mennonite Church near Guys Mills, Pennsylvania. And in 1989, I was ordained to the office of deacon at the Plainview Gospel Fellowship Church. In 1996, we moved to Litchfield, Kentucky. Now, I don't know how many of you now, where Litchfield is, how many of you are familiar with the Beside the Still Waters devotional booklet? Okay, that community compiles and mails out the Beside the Still Waters devotional booklet. We lived there until last year when they shipped us off to their latest outreach, 
which is in Owenton, Kentucky, northern Kentucky, 50 miles south of Cincinnati, Ohio. I'll give you a little bit of an idea. That's where we call home. And it's been a challenge to move to a new community. You get to be my age, it's not as easy to pull up stakes and try and make a living, but God has been good to us. And uh, we have 10 families there. And uh, so you pray for us. I consider it a challenge to preach a series of meetings. I have never preached tent meetings. I have had a few revival meetings in other churches, but never preached under a tent. I asked a couple of brethren, what's the difference? And they well, I don't know. Nobody seems to know. But our brethren here tonight told us that all of us are needy creatures, and so I believe that. One of the things that I consider when I consider a series of meetings is we have an enemy about us. I've known, I don't know how long ago it was, and Brother Rollin called me and asked about a series of meetings, and uh, I don't know how other preachers find it, but when you schedule out ahead a few years, you're almost sure the Lord's going to come back before then anyhow. And so, yeah, I guess I'll do it. But the Lord hasn't come back yet, so uh, here we are. But we do have an enemy about us, and I think we need to remember that. And I'm saying this not to discourage you. But to remind us, turn to the book of Ephesians before we go to the sermon tonight. We'd like to look at this scripture to remind us that we are facing and will face. I faced it in preparation coming here. Oh, interesting things happen to the preacher. In case you didn't know that, your ministers won't tell you that. But interesting things happen to the preacher when he's getting ready to go away for meetings. Huh? I found it out. But this is what Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. Find it, my brethren, he says in verse 10 in chapter 6 of Ephesians. Find it, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins stood about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, for which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And so we realize tonight we have an enemy about us. And our enemy is not that brother or sister in the church who doesn't agree with us. Sometimes the devil gets us to thinking, you know, we have some struggles, and maybe you don't here in, in California. But uh, we do, back east. And the devil gets us to thinking that that brother or sister that doesn't really agree with us, that's our enemy. That's not our enemy. This scripture identifies our enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers and darkness of this world. And so let's not forget who our enemy is. And he's aware. He knew about these tent meetings. And uh, so I don't say that to discourage you, but to remind us that this week, let's make a concentrated effort to be on our faces before God in prayer. This is serious business to meet here. And we trust that God will bless us as we look into his word. Now, I didn't know what to preach the first evening. I have, uh, I wondered a little bit. But we, our brother sang that song, the third song that he chose talked about revival. Tonight I would like to look at revival and I realize this is possibly a little different than a, a single church setting. But I believe tonight it's important that we understand what revival is and why it's important for God's people to experience it. Now we often set up tents in our communities because the emphasis and the focus is on evangelism. And I all agree with that. But I do think it's important that we as people of God understand that always before evangelistic efforts have been successful, to any, any degree, at least in, in recent history, first it has been preceded by revival of the church. And because of that, because of God's work 
in His people, there has been a renewed interest in the salvation of souls. And so that's why tonight we'd like to look at this. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 85. Psalm 85. I'd like to read this entire psalm. I encourage you to bring your Bibles along and to uh, follow along as we preach. I love to hear those rustling pages. And uh, I get a little bit of criticism. They tell me that uh, I talk too much, too fast. Well, too much, too, but too fast. So you, I, uh, I travel to Belize. I have an aunt who served there on the mission field for many, many years. And uh, we had the services there in Belize one time. And a little black girl came to me about the second evening and she said, Mr. Andy, uh, you talk way too fast. And I said, well, huh? I'm sorry. I'll try and slow down. And uh, she waited about one more night and she said, uh, <laughs> you still talk too fast. And I said, well, let me tell you something. Why don't you try listening faster? So I'll try and read. I think it's important that we follow along in the Word of God. It's, it's important what the preacher says. I hope you listen. But it is more important, my friends, what God's Word says. And I think as you follow along, it will bless you to see that this is what God's Word says. Verse 1, Psalm 85. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast, excuse me, thou hast turned thyself from the fiercest of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thy anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Notice especially verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to follow. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. We notice especially here, verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Revival, what does it mean? Well, according to the dictionary, it says this, means this. The act or effect of reviving, restoration, a meeting to promote religious awakening. Now, according to the Greek dictionary, and I'm not a Greek <coughs> scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but this is what it says. To make alive, to keep alive, to nourish, to preserve, to quicken, to recover, to repair, or to restore, or to be whole. It seems like it's trying to emphasize the importance of regaining lost ground. Rebuilding that which we've torn down. It means drawing closer to God. It has the meaning of preserving life. In revival meetings, as I already alluded to, we speak to the church. In evangelistic meetings, we speak to the uns unsaved. Now, let's look at verse 6, Psalm 85. David asks a question here, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Wilt is the first word he uses here in verse 6. And I think it's important we understand that we ask. We do not demand of God. Now, in, in saying that, I'm not implying that God is reluctant to grant us revival. God is not someone who's up there in heaven and he's looking down and he's thinking, oh, if, if they would just shout louder and they would just jump higher and, and whatever, the list goes on and on, I would be glad to send them revival. That's not the case. But friends, we have to realize in this thing of revival, I think it's important we get a glimpse of God and who he is. And that's why David said, he asked the question, wilt thou not revive us? We ask, we don't demand of God. Now some people are quick to quote the scripture, the Old Testament scripture that says, 
My people which are called by, the, by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from my, their, their wicked ways, that when I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And sometimes we quote that verse, and we even do it when we pray, and it's almost, I get the impression that we're trying to tell God, God, I have met all the requirements in your word, and because of that, you need to send us revival. Really? Not necessarily. Friends, none of us tonight are in any position to bargain with God. We come to God on His terms. He said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways and thoughts are so much higher than ours. And I think this thing of revival is we plead with God that He would help us to see Himself as He is and help us, most of all, to see ourselves as we are. And when we do that, we don't become proud and come into God's presence demanding that He sends us a revival. No. We cry rather with the psalmist of old who said, What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? It just boggles our mind that this great God of heaven would stoop so low as to revive us. I think we need to understand that. He goes on, Wilt thou? Where does revival come from? Anyway, where does it come from? David says, Thou, God. We need to remember that. Don't ever forget it. Revival comes from God. There's a lot of emphasis in our day today placed on men. Oh, we can get around so and so to come to our community and conduct a series of meetings. Really? I know that God needs men who are willing to be mouthpieces for Him. I want to be that this week. But friends, tonight, if anything happens, takes place this week in your life, it will be because of the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty. Be sure that He gets the honor and the glory. God gives the increase. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Remember, we are laborers together with God. And I am well aware of the this thing of, of uh, trying to fill the role of an evangelist. Sometimes there are responses when there are meetings and, and people, you know, they, they say, oh, do you see that? But you know, statistics will tell you something. There are more people saved by the preaching on Sunday morning than all the other church services combined. you believe that? Statistics tell you that. So the evangelist comes, and if there is a response, often it is because of the faithfulness of brethren that preach across this pulpit, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. So I'm aware of that. And I'm encouraging you to pray for me, but also pray for your ministers who have labored long before I arrived here at Squaw Valley. Wilt thou not revive? We already looked at the word revive. Maybe I should have asked you the question if you need revive. What do you think? It's always easy to, or easier to accomplish something if we're agreed, right? You know, not all churches would think they need revival. What did the church of Laodicea say? I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's what they thought. They were listing their credentials. They were pretty good. But I'll tell you, the all-seeing eyes of God looked down and he had a letter to write to that church. And he said, no, in reality, he said, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Yes, we do need revival. And again, revival is when God, we allow God to show us our needs and who we really are and what we really need. We admit our need. Wilt thou not revive us? And we'll look at that a little bit later. And then he says again. Wilt thou not revive us again? Now, I grew up in a setting, though I make no apology for my plain background, we did not have revival meetings. I didn't know what revival meetings were when I was growing up. But I used to think that when people talk about revival meetings, it's something, revival is something that happened one time. 
Now by that I'm not implying that we should just simply wait for revival meeting time to come around to get right with God. I think God intends for His people to experience victory all the time. The Scripture says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I think the closer we walk to the Lord Jesus Christ, the closer that is going to describe our walk. It shouldn't be this emotional high that we get during a service. And then during the week, we're uh, down in the dumps. You know, we can hardly make it. No. But we're also admitting that there are times when we need another refreshing drink. Wilt thou not revive us again? Now, someone told old Billy Sunday, he was an old evangelist of years gone by. Somebody told him one time, they said, uh, you know, those meetings you have, uh, those revival meetings, uh, they don't work. I said, what do you mean they don't work? Well, they said they don't last. You know what he said? Neither do baths, but you keep on taking them. Wilt thou not revive us again? Lord, we need a revival again. Show us thy mercy, he says in verse 7. O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Then he says, I, in verse 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. And our brother alluded to that in his devotional meditation. That's important. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. And I'm here to tell you tonight, if you don't know it already, you'll find out. I, I'm, not, I'm not overly bright, you know. And I, there will be, there's no way that I could point out all the needs that would be represented in a group this size. Number one, I'm not smart. I'll just tell you that right up front. No sense trying to kid you. You already knew that. I crammed all my school into eight years. But I'm here to tell you tonight that God knows all about us. And I don't think it's going to be my responsibility this week to point out every sin that could be represented in the lives of the people gathered here. But God is faithful. God knows all about you. And it's very possible that he will point things out in your life that this preacher doesn't even preach about. Understand that? It's important. David said, when he talked about revival, he said in verse 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. And so I'm telling you this week, it's very possible that God will, through his faithfulness, his spirit may convict you in an area that this preacher doesn't even touch on. Please mind the Lord. For he will speak peace into his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Don't turn back to sin, he said. Now, let's go to Psalm 51. And David has more to say about this thing of revival. And I think this will help us to understand the importance of making it personal. One thing I notice about tent leaves is they don't have a clock on the wall. And that's scary when you get some long-winded preacher from Kentucky, I'll tell you that. Psalm 51. Make my wife nervous. If no one else is nervous, she'll be nervous. Okay. Psalm 51. And as we read this, let's notice how that David makes this personal. Notice how often he uses the term I, me, my, mine. Have mercy, verse 1, Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me truly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. <coughs> then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure and desire, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with a sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. This thing of making revival a personal experience. Many people are quick. Did you ever notice? Quick to confess the sins of others. You ever notice that? We can do it. We get together to pray, and uh, it's just kind of easy to tell the Lord about someone else's problem. But friends, the Bible says, if we confess whose sin? Our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, by saying that, I'm not saying that you should not be concerned about the lives of your children or those you're responsible for or your neighbors or others that are lost. But I'm saying tonight that I think once we make sure that we have taken care of our personal sin problem, we are in a much better position to help others. Much better. And that's why David made this thing and it a personal issue. I could ask you, who was the first person you thought about when you thought about these revival meetings? Huh? Who do you think about, first of all? You talk about, oh, we're going to set up that tent over there. But at tent meetings, who came to your mind? Hmm? Anyone? You don't have to say it out loud, but be honest. Think about who? Who really needed to be here? Oh, I hope so-and-so comes every night. He sure needs it. Really? That might be true. But friends, I think it's possible to miss a blessing personally if you're always thinking about how much someone else needs that sermon or needs revival. I think about the first time we ever sat as a family under a week of meetings. It was a new experience for our family. We grew up in an Amish home. We didn't go to revival meetings. So after we joined the Amish Mennonite Church, we had a week of meetings, and I remember very clearly. It was a wonderful experience for us. But I remember after those meetings closed, our congregation was a little unusual. The pastor that was in charge there died of an aneurysm. There was a short time after we were attending there, and so there was some absentee leadership in charge. We had a series of meetings, Meetings closed. We had a wonderful time. At least I thought we did. But right after that service was over, within a few short weeks, a sister in that congregation brought a serious accusation against one of the brethren. And so the ministers in charge came and investigated. In the, char in the time of investigation and hearing out the parties, they asked a question. Uh, didn't you just have a week of meetings uh, a couple weeks ago? You know what that sister said? Yes, we did. And I kept wondering when Brother So-and-So was going to respond. Well, they interviewed Brother So-and-So. Uh-huh, sure did. The accusations were completely false. Now, who do you think, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out, but who do you think received the greatest blessing that week, that week of meeting? Huh? You want to guess? You think that sister received much of a blessing that week? Spending all that time looking over her shoulder. I said, oh, I hope you heard that. When's he going to respond? Anyway. Friends, let's be men. Let's admit like David, confess our sin. Lord, let's make this thing personal. Another thing we, some of us like to read, I enjoy reading. And uh, you can read about revivals in the past when people responded in large numbers and sometimes evangelists, uh, they begin to scratch their head and they say, well, what's wrong today? And people ask questions like that. Why don't we see that today? I think rather than waiting for some spectacular moving of the spirit, when there's a large amount of response, I think that we should do something personal, first of all. 
old Gypsy Smith, somebody asked him one time, he said, how do you start a revival? He said, well, I'll tell you what I would suggest. So go into your room, he said, and lock the door. Take a piece of chalk, draw a circle on the floor, kneel down in the middle of that circle and say, oh, Lord, start a revival. And let it start inside this circle. He said, when God has answered that prayer, revival has begun. Because I'll tell you something. I already alluded to it. When God's people are revived, does it stay within the walls of the church? What do you think? No, it does not. Evangelism, and I'll repeat myself, I believe evangelism has always, at least in the later generations, has been the result of revival among God's people. David alludes to it here. Listen, he talks about God meeting his need, forgiving his sin. And then he says this. Let's read verses 13, 14, and 15. He asks to be restored. Then he says, then will I do what? Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Sounds like evangelism to me, huh? Absolutely. I have a camera. That's important. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And what? I'm going to go home and think about it a while? No. My tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. That's what happens when God's people experience revival. Others hear about it. And the result is evangelism. Verse, notice verses 6 and 7. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And friends, again tonight, God is the only one that's able to look into that darkest recess of your life. I can be here all week, and it's very possible that I won't be able to discover what hidden sin you have in your life. Your mom and dad, may, you may go through this whole week, and mom and dad don't know. The preachers don't know. But I'm here to remind you, you are not kidding away with anything. No. God knows. God knows all about it. And that's why it's so futile to try and hide and to think that somehow you're going to be able to get, a, get away with something. You're not going to get away with anything. You need to understand that. God's word is quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. All creatures are manifesting as something. We need to understand that. God wants to do his work in our lives. Now, the price for revival has always been high. Let's go to the Old Testament further. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 7. Let's notice here. The price for revival has always been high. First Samuel chapter 7. Let's begin reading in verse 1. And the men of Kirjath Jir and came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jir, and the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord, talking now about revival. Return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Samuel reminded God's people there is a price to be paid if you want to experience renewal and revival. The, you know the story. Israel had fallen into apostasy. The Philistines had taken away the ark of the Lord. Eli's sons were among the 30,000 that died on the battlefield. When Eli heard the news, he, fought, he fell down, broke his neck, and died. That was a sad day for Israel. Now it says here, all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. They wept. I want to ask you a question. Where are the tears of this generation? When was the last time you saw a preacher preach with tears running down his cheeks? Does it happen today? 
It's not too late. Today, people want their sermons delivered with a smile. You know? Nice, easy sermons. Shorter the better. Better believe it. Better get us home before you know what. But I'll tell you, Samuel reminded this, these people, he says, the price for revival is high. It's possible. But we need to mean business with God. We need to understand that this isn't something that we just do uh, haphazardly. If we feel like it. Where are the tears of this generation? I believe it's possible that our eyes are dry because our hearts are dry. And so I think we need to take inventory of ourselves personally. Samuel outlines to Israel what they need to do to experience God's blessing. Return unto the Lord with all your heart. Put away the strange gods. Prepare your hearts. And then the next several verses, and I won't read them for the sake of time, but he emphasizes prayer. Our brother talked about prayer, and it blessed me that you want to take some time and meet out here. I think that's good. But I'll tell you something I have on my bookshelf, and other preachers may too. All kinds of books about revival. And every one of them emphasizes prayer. And I say amen. But I do want to tell you, if you read this scripture, you begin to understand that prayer is no substitute for obedience. Somehow people think that the only thing that has kept the church from experiencing revival is we haven't prayed long enough and loud enough and whatever. That's not always the case. I think we need to act on that which we already know. You think God is going to give you more light if you're not living out what he has already brought to your attention? Not hardly. It doesn't work that way. And Samuel told these people, you need to understand. You already know. And often that's the case in reviving. It's not something new that comes to our mind, but it's something that been down here, we know it's there. Remember, prayer is no substitute for obedience. Now, let's go to Genesis 35. We have, any, we have an example here that we'd like to look at. Verse 1. Genesis 35, verse 1. God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Now, Bethel wasn't much to see for most people, but to Jacob it was the most hallowed spot on earth. This was where he camped the first night as he was leaving home, fleeing from an angry brother, and here is where he met God. Let's go back several chapters to Genesis 28 and understand why God came to Jacob and told him to return to Bethel. Genesis 28, beginning to read in verse 10. This is after the deception, and Jacob is leaving home, probably for the first time ever. And Jacob went out, Genesis 28, verse 10, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places where thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob waked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. In English it says, how dreadful is this place. In German it says, wie heilig ist diese Städte? How holy is this place? And Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put for his pillows and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go 
and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou hast given me, I will surely give the tenth to thee. That's the setting for Genesis 35, verse 1 that we read. Many years have passed since Jacob had made that vow to God. And Jacob had fallen short of keeping his commitment to God. I want to ask you tonight, have you kept the commitments you've made to God? How honest have you been? Promises you made to God and to the church. Now, let's go back and read again Genesis 35. Let's read a verse further. I'll read again verse 1. Years have passed and Jacob is now making his way back. And as he's going back to meet his brother Esau for the first time now, God says to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. And let us rise and go up to Bethel. And I will make there an altar unto God who appeared unto me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Do you read anywhere where God came to Jacob and he said, Jacob, you've got idols in your possession and you need to get rid of them. You read it here? You don't read it there. He said to Jacob, he said, Jacob, you go to Bethel and you build an altar there. And Jacob comes to his family, he says, give me your idols. I'm here to tell you tonight, there were idols in Jacob's possession and he knew it. How is it with you? You know, we can put on such a tremendous front. I think on the outside, everything looked good in Jacob's life. But it wasn't well. He knew it, and God knew it. And that's why he came to his family. He said, give me those animals. And he cleaned house, and he buried them there under the oak tree. Friends, tonight I'm telling you again that it's not possible... And it's not, I don't think, my responsibility to point out to you every area in your life that you may have fallen short in serving God. But this thing of being able to deceive people, I want to close by telling you a story that strikes home to this preacher's heart. In 1996, we had moved to Litchfield, Kentucky. And in September of that year, on September the 22nd, we had council meetings. That Sunday morning, our two oldest sons were church members. And the way we do it in our congregation, most of the time when we have council meeting, everyone stands, takes a turn and stands in the auditorium and gives their expression of having peace with God, a relationship with God and with their fellow man, and opens up their lives. And I remember as a father, I was the preacher, one of the preachers. I watched those, I watched our congregation. I was sitting up front. And I remember watching my two sons stand to their feet and give testimony of having peace with God and with their fellow man. And I believed every word of it. They lived in my house. In my mind, they were good boys. Monday evening, we started a week of revival meetings in our church, following the council meeting service. I don't remember what the preacher preached, but I remember he gave an invitation. No one responded. All seemed to be well. Tuesday evening, same way. Preached, gave an invitation, no one responded. All was well. Wednesday morning, our son Leon, 16 years old, leaves for work. He leaves early. It gets warm in Kentucky. I know I've taken some ribbing. People remind me. Seabury might not be the greatest in California, but you can't beat this weather. You're right. It's nice. They go early. They go to church to work early because you want to beat the heat, okay? So he left before daylight. We got a phone call. It was just getting light. Phone rang. My wife answered. They said, "This is the local hospital. You have a son named Leon? Yes. You better come. He's in the emergency room. He's had an automobile accident. So we quickly rushed to the hospital. Local hospital. We had only lived there about three, four, five months. I don't know how many months it was. 
And as I was walking up to the emergency door entrance, there was a local sheriff. I had just met him a few weeks before. Big old strapping, six foot four, big fella. He came over, he put his arm on my shoulder. He said, Andy, your son's been in an accident. He said, I haven't even been out to the accident site yet. They had him in the emergency room. He said, I want you to go in and see your son. And if you care to, we'll go out to the accident scene. I said, okay. So my wife and I go back in the emergency room. And they take us back there, and they had my son, our son, laying on a gurney. They pulled the curtain back. There was a nurse back there, and she stepped out to give us a few moments of privacy. They had him completely covered up except for part of his face. And he had his face mashed in right above the bridge of his nose here, and there was blood running down over his face. And I didn't know if he was awake or conscious or not, and I just stepped over and put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, Liam, Mom and I are here. And he began to weep just softly and quietly. He began to cry. And I said, uh, Leon, what, what happened? And he just shook his head and he started to cry louder. And I said, Leon, what's wrong? I said, I thought, I thought maybe he's worried about the car. I said, don't worry about the car. We can get another car. Is there something wrong? And he began to weep loud. He said, yes. And I said, what? And the words that he spoke struck fear and terror to my heart. He said, Daddy... I wasn't ready to die. I said, Liam, are you ready to die now? He said, yes, I am. And I began to weep. I fell on that gurney and I wept with my son. I said, Liam, you weren't ready to die. He said, no, I wasn't ready to die. Friends, he was the preacher's boy. If my son would have died that morning on the way to work, we would have had a funeral service and I would have expected to see my son in glory. Not all was well between him and God. I'll tell you what happened. He had a blowout on the right front tire of his car. Now listen to me, young people, and all of us. You have an idea you're going to have an accident? You think, oh, I'll have time to pray the sinner's prayer, and I'll have time to get ready to die? Is that what you think? It doesn't always work that way. I asked my son, I said, what happened? Later, after he was home from the hospital. He said, I remember having a blowout on the right front tire of that car. And he went down a steep bank. And he said all he could do was, all went through his mind was, I'm going to have a wreck. He clutched that steering wheel so hard. He went down the bank into a creek and he hit a stump. I mean, practically dead center. And you talk about totaling a car. It tore the shoulder strap on his own seatbelt. I went down there with that, with that uh, yeah, I, what I started to say. You think you're going to pray the sinner's prayer? He said he never, never thought of that. Never thought of that. All he thought was self-preservation. I'm going to have a wreck. Bent that steering wheel all the way up to the steering top. By sheer, hanging on to it. I, I went with that sheriff after they left the ambulance. I went with that sheriff out there with that car. And we walked up to that car. It was hard to see. It was down in some brush. When that big old six foot four sheriff saw that car, he began to weep. He said, Andy, I want to tell you something. He said, about a year ago, I walked up to an accident on the Western Kentucky Parkway. He said, I didn't know it at the time, but he said it was my daughter. Ran off the road and hit a rock wall. And he said, the only difference was my daughter never came home. We walked up to that car, and I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what it looked like. My son, we still don't know who called the sheriff, who called the, the ambulance. My son said he remembers when he hit that stump. He thought it was smoke. He thought the car was on fire. He tried to get out the front, two front doors, couldn't get out. He crawled over the seat, tried to kick out the back door. He had one door left. He said, I just remember there was a little crack on the driver's side in the back, a little four-door car. He thought the car was on fire. It was actually smoke from the, or steam from the radiator. He said, I remember clawing my way up through the grass and the mud up to, the, up to uh, Route 62 there, 259 North. And he said, when I got up there, he said, there was a man standing there who said, I've already called the authorities. We don't know. I think it was an angel. Next thing he knew, he woke up in the emergency room. But I walked over to that car and I thought, you know, I wonder what my son was listening to on the way to work. So I wrenched open, I got open that car door and I got the cassette and I had to work to get the cassette out. He had a cassette in there. You know what it said? Living for Jesus. That was the title of the cassette. 
I got the key ring and I ripped it out of the ignition. You know what it said on that key ring? God is love. Friends, I'm here to tell you God is love. He sure is. He spared my son's life. Tonight he's a Christian. Oh, he wasn't guilty of what you would call big and gross sins. But there were things in his life where he was not right with God. The preacher's boy. Wonderful testimony. All his friends loved him, thought he was great. Friends, I'm here to tell you tonight, it's serious business. I can't see into your heart. I don't know tonight if all is well between you and God. But I believe like Jacob of old and like my son in 1996, you know whether there's something between you and God. And friends, tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity. We're going to extend an invitation tonight. And if you need to respond, I'm here to tell you, God is love. And tonight is your opportunity. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we bow here tonight thanking you and praising you for your goodness and your mercy to us, sons of men. Oh God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. We thank you for forgiveness. And oh God, tonight, as we consider the scriptures, your compassion, your mercy, your desire for your people to be revived and to have their sins blotted out and forgiven, oh God, we consider this a wonderful opportunity to extend an invitation to anyone that's here. Lord, we pray that you would drive back the evil forces, the powers of darkness, anything that would hinder anyone from responding tonight, if they need to respond. Oh, God, have your will and way in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed, eyes closed, we're just going to sing from memory a few verses of the old invitation hymn, Just As I Am. And friends, I'm not going to beg and tarry on. We are going to give you an opportunity. If you need to respond, please make your way behind the nursery, little, nursery building, this little tan building in the back there to my right, and someone will come and counsel with you. Again, God is a merciful God. But His Spirit will not always strive with you. You may not have the opportunity to repent. I don't know, but God knows. If you need to come, come quickly as we sing just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me says, just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. That Thank describes you. you tonight and you can't wait to get rid of it. Please come as we extend an invitation. Just as I am and waiting not to close that part of the invitation. I trust you've been honest with God and with yourself. Though I want to remind you, God's invitation is still open. I'm going to open up briefly, publicly, if someone has something they would like to share, a word of testimony or confession. We'll pause just a moment for that. Will there be anyone? Okay, if not, thank you for your prayers and your attentiveness. God bless you. Please continue to pray. Let's stand together for the benediction.
Heavenly Father, as we come to the close of this service now, we thank you again for the privilege of having been here. We ask your parting blessing on us now as we dismiss and depart from this place. May you continue speaking to us from the Word of God, and Lord, we pray if there was someone here tonight who needed to respond and did not, we ask that you and your mercy would continue to convict them to speak to them. Watch over us now as we go our separate ways. Keep us in your care and help us to remember that you're coming back soon. May we be ready for that great day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Depart in Jesus' name.